There we go. Welcome to OMG. Uh, this is episode six. It is. Yeah, already. Damn, that's uh, that's going uh, fast. So it's uh, about two months we already started this uh, this new show. And uh, this week, that's going to be me, Truthman, uh, Xiala, and Jens from uh, from Alpha Cool, all the way from Germany. And we're going to have to uh, hold on a little bit on the news and, uh, and and see how everything is doing. As you can see, we changed a little bit the uh, the setup. The nice living room you have, I have to say. Yeah, I, I like I like the space and it looks very good on the camera as well. Uh, so it's you the brick wall. It's all yeah, the brick wall. and they're they're not aligned. Well, uh, it's not the camera. Uh, it's actually <laughs> the, the, the wall, wall is that is not straight. Not straight. <laughs> <laughs> so that's always a, a, a tricky a, a tricky way here in in Quebec for that. Uh, welcome to OMG Overclocking Mod Game. We talk about a few different topics. Uh, basically, the latest news in the hardware industry, latest news in the game industry that we like to talk about, and of course, modding, PC modding, console modding, everything modding. As long as it's not cars. Good. We could talk about yeah. cars, but um, I yeah. like PCs better. Yeah. So, so let's focus on the uh, technology side. Uh, before we welcome, uh, we go into the latest news. We have Jens with us, and you will be able to see him right here. Hey, Jens, how are you doing? Good, good so far. I, I hope you guys as well. And we have now the living room show. I mean, you in the living room, <laughs> me in the living room. And you I have a nice, we, a we nice share the same taste for <laughs> IKEA lights, so we, we got a, <laughs> a thing going here. That, that's definitely one of the one of the highlight of tonight. Um, uh, sponsored IKEA by likes. IKEA. <laughs> Not sponsored by IKEA. I wish, but <laughs> like, come on, that, that, that's like like twelve bucks. <laughs> Still useful. All right, uh, let's dive into the news before we go into the conversation with Jens. Tim, what are the news for this week? Okay, so one of the big news for this week was mainly uh, the whole debate or the whole I don't know how you call it drama or whatever. Um, about Ninja, so Ninja, who's a famous uh, streamer that is mostly famous on Twitch and YouTube. Um, he's uploading videos every day on YouTube. He gets like millions of views for every he's single day. He's streaming a lot. He's streaming, and he's streaming a lot. A lot Actually, he's mostly known for streaming. It's insane. Exactly. So Ninja made apparently, because it was not actually officially disclosed or anything, one million dollars US uh, for. But from EA for being paid basically to play Apex Legends, which is the new popular game on the block. Um, now, I think the news sort of started out of uh, mainstream media. So mainstream media, you know, there's always this story about, hey, oh, look at those gamers. Uh, those people in the room playing yeah. games all day long. <laughs> so it's basically, I think it all started from mainstream media, people that are not used to see uh, basically kids in the rooms or people... Uh, the younger generation making money from video games, right? And uh, making a lot of money in this case, and people were being all surprised. So you have Business Insider, you have uh, new, like uh, all kinds of like uh, New York Times and all that doing articles about it. It was crazy. And then, of course, it was then picked up by the whole uh, more like a geeky community. And then you had PC Gamer make articles about it. There are all sorts of articles everywhere. Uh, and everyone is sort of in between. Is it enough money? Is it not enough? Um, does he deserve to get the money and all kinds of questions I that actually don't really deserve to be asked. I mean, like... Well, it's good that we ask them now. Yeah. Uh, I hope that we ask them now and we don't get to that in the next few months or years because that's going to happen more and more anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I did a bit of research uh, to sort of try to figure out on my own in terms of money spent uh, if $1 million for a sponsorship is actually a lot or not. So uh, that's the question. Is one million dollar uh, too expensive or not enough expensive for for a, a promotion show like this? Like, well, okay, okay, okay. First, yeah. first, first. <laughs> what did exactly Ninja uh, do for that one million dollar? Do we um, know? So it's we don't know exactly what's the content of the contract. Or we don't know exactly. Maybe it's on, over the long term. Maybe actually he gets paid one million, but it's gonna be for playing Apex once a month for the 12 next month. We don't know, right? Uh, but it's basically, it was paid to play the game. That's all we know. And uh, from what we know that he made publicly, yes, he played the game, just like every streamer out there. Um, yes, of course, he did his own kind of like review of it. Uh, he did a stream where he was sort of sharing his feelings and experience about it. And it is true that Apex Legends is sort of still a game in the creation. So it's not a completely final game yet, just like most of the game when they come out nowadays. Uh, 
Uh, well, do you consider to... Finnish if you still have DLCs yeah, well, that you, fix the game? In you some get sort? that, and then you have also all this aspect of like uh, there are maybe some uh, some weapons that can be improved in terms of making less damage, more damage. Try to make level the playing fields for all the different kinds of players and kinds of way pay people play the game. And most of the time, the developers don't really know how the people are going to play the game before they actually put people in the game playing the game. And also, Apex is one of the games where you have a lot of players on the same map, so it's also a different way that people are going to play it. Uh, just like Fortnite, and when you see what people create now in Fortnite, it's probably something really far away of what the initial Fortnite creators had envisioned for the game. Um, so, we don't know what exactly was the contract, uh, but there's this one million number being thrown at it, and the name of the game. And Actually, that's... maybe it's, it's, that's not even true, maybe. Maybe it's more than that. It's it's a or private less. contract between <laughs> two private entities. There's, no one will never disclose what's in there. And um, I mean, it's the same from what I looked at when I did my research for what athletes in the sports world are paid for contracts. It's sort of like communicated, but there's no source about it. No one knows. It's insider information. Uh, someone at Nike, someone at Puma, whatever, who shared some number at some point. There are some numbers that may have to be disclosed because those big professional players become maybe like more bigger companies and they need to disclose some sort of information about their assets and their revenues or whatever. Uh, but in most cases, it's just really people just throwing numbers at stuff. And I think a lot of people either just being jealous or just being like completely mind boggled by the amounts, uh, which I understand for probably some people, $1 million uh, for just playing a game seems like a big thing. $1 million. <laughs> Yes. Actually, it's one billion, but that's okay. Yeah, but basically. So, so what did yeah. you find out? Okay, so I found what I looked at basically was uh, athletes, so people that play sports, but not electronic sports, right? So not compared to uh, other esports, because we know for other esports how much, for example, ESL pays out teams when they play in tournaments, and we don't know that for a team, for example, if there are six players plus the manager, the money is split up, sort of, etc. So we sort of know how much those people are earning when they. At, at least we have a range pre-tax right yeah and then basically i looked at what they say for sports and i looked at for example people that were in the olympic and in the olympics the, the amounts are all based on the medals you earn so the more medals you earn the more money you make and it's something like twenty thousand dollars for a gold medal fifteen thousand for a silver one etc but now, that depends on the sports uh it's no it's that's the price cash value of that comes with a medal. So when you get a medal, you get so a medal and what, you get a cash. Whatever is the sports, sports you're doing it. Yes. So you do curling or you do yes. uh, biathlon and you're gonna have this 20,000 if you get the gold medal. That's, yeah, from what I understood how it works. They okay. don't try to make, uh, it's not because your sport is more popular and more people watch, I don't know, uh, some kind of running like a 100 meter, whatever. Uh, it's not because this is more popular than curling that the curling guys earn just 10 bucks because no one watched right uh, well actually that's not true here but yeah that's a yeah, different I story mean, it's there's definitely less viewers <laughs> but uh so yeah so it's not that much money if you put that in perspective maybe with the amount of physical training they go through but if you put that in perspective with the amount that someone like Nija plays every day in the terms of hours he spends every day doing his job uh, it's probably relatively about the same. It's and it's not that much far off. Um, so then I looked at bigger sponsorships. So people in different kinds of sports, uh, professional football players, uh, professional baseball players, etc. Uh, and there's this article. It's really funny, and they sort of show like uh, how many people Nike, for example, sponsored across different sports, right? So it gives you how much they sponsored in terms of people in different sports and how much money did they spend on athletes. And um, so that data is for 2012. So, it's so not, that's pretty uh, far It's off. already yeah. old and uh, you would assume right now they're spending more just with inflation, something like that. But they were spending already 230 millions a year just sponsoring people. And that's, that's just not without excluding all the other marketing expenses they probably So that's just like people they sponsor directly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then in that article, for example, they give like some some extra stats from some Olympic uh, sponsorships that some ex famous athletes earned on top of that. Usain Bolt, so the fastest man on earth, he earned like 20 million uh, over the whole Olympic just by being sponsored by Puma, 9 million, and then Visa and the other guys, uh, Nissan and 
car companies in Belgium, etc. So imagine he made 20 million on top of earning the medals and for the Olympics, just for the Olympics, right? Just for the Olympics, so which are about without, which are about 10 days. That's maybe yeah, maybe so 10 that's days one million a day. All the preparation <laughs> oh, 20 days, and oh, yeah. maybe whatever vlogs he does before and marketing, whatever. Uh, but so that's something to put into perspective right and uh, and i think in the end when you look at it and what some professional football players professional tennis players do or whatever in your country one million is actually not that much so i don't think there's that much of a big drama to have uh, it is great for gaming and esports in general that there is that kind of money as well because it sort of drives um, the forces that are driving esports and everything um, to grow at something that is getting bigger and it only gets bigger because the sponsors are lining up. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to think that sports doesn't just get big because there are people watching online. You also need basically the cash to drive all that. And uh, even platforms like Twitch would not exist without Amazon. So you have to think about all those things that make it actually possible nowadays. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, what I found out. And I'm actually in the end, one million is not that much. Okay. Uh, Jens, uh, would you yes. play a game for one million dollar? What a question. If, if I get one million just for playing one game, okay, no problem at all. I play that, <laughs> I played it from the, from the day on, uh, every day, no problem. Uh, but I guess, I guess what we're talking here is, uh, is it worth it to spend for a company to spend so much money for one guy? Um, is it needed to do so? Um, I personally thinking yes, it is. It is normal because uh, if you have uh, a certain amount of fans, people following you, kind of uh, yeah, fame, then you get automatically in the core of interest of every marketing guy in every company. And if this publisher it was a publisher, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spend the money, yeah. So and, I feel and normal for that. There's one thing as well with uh, with EA and especially for, with uh, Apex Legend is that they did not do a lot of teasing before. They had no marketing stuff before. They basically went, hey, here's a new game. That's the guys from Titanfall that made that game and go play it now. And they mm. exploded uh, the way to do, uh, to do the release of a game like that. So maybe they had a lot of cash to spare. So maybe, <laughs> actually, if you think about that, $1 million in terms of advertisement is not that much. Like no, for over over the long run, like few months, yeah. uh, if you need to have like specific event where you bring in people, they had a specific event where they brought in special streamers to launch the, the, the game. Don't get me wrong. But that was just like one event or just a few limited amount of people. It's not something like, hey, let's blow up everything at GDC. We are doing this, which will cost, yeah, pretty much like, like that one million. So now having that on one person, it's just a matter of how you value uh, the, the return on investment on that specific person. Mm -hmm. um, I know you and were looking at the stats for that. And it works. And it, it works. And it we, works we talk, yeah. we're, we're talking now about it. Mm -hmm. It's now a, to a topic and, and every media so be a topic jump on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it will be nothing if, if it just be a normal advertisement and it will be everywhere. Yeah? Or it will be just 5,000 euro each gamer. Yeah? And yeah, now it's sure. one guy, big amount, everyone talking about it. Exactly. And, and that guy has, I mean, he has really good numbers too. It's not just one big guy. He has 21 million subscribers on YouTube. Well, it's uh, huge. If, it's huge. And if you look at his videos, like one video published yesterday already has 1.1 million views, right? And it's the same for every single video he posts. And as soon as it's like hits like a week or two or three days, it's only it's at 2 million. So I'm pretty sure uh, that amount, considering the amount of views and eyeballs and everything he drives it's it's peanuts yeah so do you think he should get more i think he should get more yes uh, maybe he just didn't feel like getting more because of the backlash he might get you know i think that's something that um all of this youtube generation creators and new famous people they sort of get scared of right because they're like they don't want to be appealing as someone that is disingenuous or that sort of gets paid money to do something. You know, it's the online internet kind of like creator culture, right? And like the, the, the love-hate relationship with money? Yeah, it's like uh, if you're a poor YouTuber, everyone loves you. And then if you're a YouTuber that starts to make money, people start to like, eh, 
you know, who's this guy? He's trying to make money. And uh, most of the YouTubers need to go through that kind of like transition. It's the same for big YouTubers, but we see it also um, uh, on our end from the, the tech tuber sort of side of things where you have like maybe um, tech tubers that were regularly scoring 30,000, 40,000 views per videos and now hits 100, 200,000. And then they, of course, they need to run their business, right? They need to monetize it. They know they are maybe not going to able to do that full time for all their life too. Uh, maybe they need to pay salaries for people that help them in production, people that do their sales, people that receive their hardware, that check it, that do the test because you can't review everything all the time. Uh, and if you're the actor and you're just like Linus, for example, mm -hmm. you're running your business, then you need to pay all those people and you, it doesn't happen with free hardware. And that's basically, I think the transition people don't see and they probably don't realize also that behind Ninja and that one million deal, there's probably not just Ninja himself. I mean, no, but yeah, even, yeah, but even you have a company, even you have a company mm -hmm. in this business like Linus have, it's not that the value, you know, the value comes because of the content he produced yes. and the viewers. So he has so many viewers, so people watch it, people follow him. He's the biggest uh, a tech YouTuber, a YouTuber. so, uh, or Twitcher or what? I don't know. Yeah, sure. um, so the the people follow him, and of course give it marketing people in the companies who pay that that amount for that because mm -hmm. they see the the value of the views. So uh, yeah, if, same sure for this guy, same for right. the Ninja guy now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he 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 comes up now have one million. Let's say it's a real number. For sure, next time when a new game will be published, someone come out with two or five. Oh, it's a bidding game, right? It's like it is. It his is. time is limited. He cannot play all the games. Okay, then price price will have to rise somehow. Well, yeah, also, like, also, also because this, the the story works, you know, mm -hmm. you 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 do you do a big amount for one guy. Or people talking about it. Okay, next time must be the amount bigger. Let's do five million. All people talking about it. <laughs> for them, it's, it's for the publisher. It's nothing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Up to the point where everyone just don't want the amounts to be public anymore. Yeah, the like, the, the mean, game, co the that, game costs that happened all the time. <laughs> yeah, and that happened all the time. I mean, football player. Who are you to say? Oh, yeah, they make a lot of money. Yeah, they make a. Well, when you hear just, money. just hear about football transfers in Europe and the pricing, like uh, the agents just get, or just the player gets, or the clubs are so it's like tens of millions. It's not just yes. one million. It's tens of millions, and we're talking even for sometimes exchange fees that someone is collecting that actually did nothing, or like close to nothing. You know? that, that's just yeah. a broker, someone that arranged the deal or something, uh, and those guys get more and they do nothing. They just do paperwork. So. They put people in contact and in touch. Well, it's the word of And business. prepare the deal. There's a question no. on the chat. Uh, spending all that money on a free game, not sure if it makes sense uh, for them to sell more games. I think, actually, so the Apex Legends is free to play. So there's no money that EA earns if you sign up or if you play the game. But they earn money on what you spend in the game. So it's the so. classic example of loot boxes, not loot boxes, but like all that kind of like digital things you can buy. In it's games. it's like there with all free to plays. Yeah, that's it's like this with all the free to plays. Actually, and it's not you; it's existence no. World of Warcraft. No, World of Warcraft, you have to pay for the membership. Yeah, but you also have to pay for extra shit. So that was double double <laughs> uh, double edge hammer. No, but I mean, if you look at Dota, LOL, you don't you don't buy the game. That's free to play. Yes. So that that's. That the, the business model, the model of those yeah. games is not as we need to sell more games, is we need to have more players. A lot of players to actually make that percentage of cash in yes, the game. Because maybe only, I don't know actually what's the percentage, maybe 40% of the people that play a game are free to play end up spending money. I don't know what are the statistics, but uh, basically it's, it's this, right? There's no ads in the game, so you only depend on people buy, buying stuff. So. The only way you can make more money is to increase the pool of people you have or offer more compelling digital stuff to buy. Digital stuff that don't cost much to produce. It would be interesting to actually research that, um, the proportion of people that uh, I pay know, money in free to play. I know Did you ever paid something within uh, free to play? No, actually, I... See, so I'm not part yeah, of this. Yes. I'm not part of that target group. Did you ever buy something within a game? Like a skin yeah, of for course. For example, when you play uh, Pokemon Go, mm -hmm. I... You must one time buy balls or something, you know, because uh, you you don't want to wait until you find enough to to throw them to the Pokemons. 
you would suddenly want to immediately want to have them, so you buy them. Yeah. So uh, this 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 game, for example, make already two hundred million in in the first three months. You know. So and, and that was not selling the game. That was selling yes. stuff in the game. So they basically yes. just let you play in a store. That's basically what happened. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's uh, yeah. That's interesting. Well, I guess that's uh, I quite that's... a good overview for the one million dollar. <laughs> Is that enough? We never know. And let's dive into more questions with you, Jens. So, I mean, welcome again. Uh, Thank for you. All, for all the people that just saw you but don't know you or never saw you before, um, who are you, what you do, where are you from? Um, okay, I'm coming from Germany. I'm living in Hamburg, working for Aqua Tuning and also for Alpha Cool. Um, I'm in charge of um, the OEM business um, and the B2B business for industrials and retailers and resellers and so on for both companies. Um, that's that's I need to say. It's uh, it's two individual companies. It's, uh, Alpha Cool is famous for the water cooling uh, brand Alpha Cool, as everyone knows, and Aqua Tuning is uh, I will say the leading distributor in the industry for water cooling. And uh, yes, it's true, Aqua Tuning owns Alpha Cool. So if I'm working at Aqua Tuning, I do also Alpha Cool business. But um, I'm working for both companies because I'm doing dedicated stuff also for Alpha Cool. So OEM business, for example, it's a um, typical Alpha Cool business. So, so you do OEM, and for those that just joined uh, here on Twitch and that have no idea what OEM means, it's basically building product for others to sell, correct? Correctly. Uh, we, we design even products for others, which will be not under our design, published, will just be published under the design of the customer brand name. Okay, so, so either they can buy a design you have in catalog and rebrand it for their product, or you can make something just for them and they sort of like... Com competition do like that. We we want to be differently. Right. We really listening to the customer what they really want. We check their, uh, their design, what they're using already in their existing products, and mm -hmm. then we try to match their design that they meet their need and bring it to the market. But of course, it gives us a customer that just buy uh, our design. So mm -hmm. our Alpha Cool design just with another label on it. That's all. Okay. Uh, for someone, say, that would have an idea of a water cooling product he wants to create, what are sort of the conditions or that you need to meet to be able to, for example, uh, produce a part with you guys? Mm. Like, yeah, how much mm. money do you need? How much uh, ideas and info you already need to know about what you want to mm. do before to approach you? That, that's, a, that's a very tough question, but a good one. Um, yeah, we have indeed a lot of people who are coming to us with uh, ideas and, for example, want to create a new uh, reservoir or want to create a new water block. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people forgot that it costs a lot of tooling and a lot of uh, um, manpower or um, processing to create an, an item and uh, therefore it's necessary to say we need a minimum order quantity to first pay us, pay our partners or uh, our own people who are working for us and uh, and then of course he need to consider about if he have really the market for it. Um, if we want uh, us to market it it's also possible you can uh, give us a license and we we sell it under Alpha Cool or under Aqua Tuning uh, with his name. That's possible at all. But most of the time is the issue that the people who are creating something have a good idea but don't have money to do that. The money what they need for doing this project is by number difficult to say, but I will say if you don't have 50,000 don't don't, don't thinking bother, yeah. don't thinking about it. Yeah, I'm thinking mostly behind this question. You know, like uh, a lot of people nowadays um, 
have ideas and then they go to Kickstarter to try to find the money. So it's a good way. They, they still need people to manufacture and help them with the design because they are maybe not experts. And I think yes. it's good that people know aqua tuning for that, right? So they know, okay, I have an idea. You know what? I'm going to do this Kickstarter. I'm going to raise the money I need for whatever aqua tuning and the production takes and then the margin I want to make. Uh, to yep. get me started, sort of, basically, and I think could be a, it's kind of like a good thing to to know if uh, creators totally. out there are sort of interested in that. Totally, we even we even supporting that. I mean, if people come to us and say they don't have money, but we have marketing power or something, they know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Then we even say, okay, we we working with you, try to make a business case happen in some way. And if you market it over Kickstarter or, or a lot of other ways how you can yep. get followers for your product, then, yeah, it's something what we can consider about it. But to say generally to everyone, yes, we do, is, is not possible to say. Um, we need to see the business case. I mean, it must be, make sense. I see. And you need to make sure that you actually, on your hand, you need to make sure that you're going to get paid as well. Uh, I mean, that's that's the... The burden of every business i mean you don't do it for fun i mean it's good for prototyping uh but if you want to sell that you need to have like a real business case behind it and if yeah you can have the best product in the world but if no one wants to buy it that's useless it's business yeah. <laughs> so actually um i have another question um all right in terms of manufacturing right so a lot of the kickstarter we've seen over the previous few years uh, people come up with products, uh, they design them sometimes. Uh, for them, the, the biggest challenge is the production. Uh, a lot of guys mm -hmm. on Kickstarter, especially in the PC space, uh, you have all those mini ITX cases and those concepts things and stuff like that. Not so much water cooling, mostly cases. Uh, people go to China to manufacture. And mostly and in Shenzhen. Mostly in Shenzhen or somewhere there, and they struggle with the manufacturing. The biggest part mm -hmm. being uh, QA, uh, so the quality of the production, making sure it's right, uh, even anodizing is done right. You have questions um, getting the right parts, the right cuts, everything together, the proper packaging. And some guys end up having to sleep on the factory floor to sort of supervise their, their baby products that they're trying to get through. Um, is there any advantage of instead of doing that, working with aqua tuning for it? Do you guys manufacture in Germany? How would that be a different case, basically? Oh, just where you say sleeping at a factory is remind me on my my old history and I was the founder of, of Nanoxia and yeah stay two years in China and sleeping in a factory and uh, taking taking care of the manufacturing of fans and so on so yeah uh, it is a hard hard way to start a brand name and start a product um, and a lot of people just going to China and try to find a manufacturer and just hoping that he doing that what they want. <laughs> um, our biggest biggest uh, point, I think, is we speaking mostly the language of the customer, because we have our own brand name. We know how to market it because we have a marketing business. We have a an online shop in uh, 32 countries, so we know uh, how to bring products alive and um, this is something where we see our biggest benefit when we're talking with customers because we understand their way they're doing. Most of the Chinese manufacturers, they never they never compete or then even win the competition in in the Western world. Um, I mean, the only exception is, and that's not China, is Taiwan. Uh, Taiwanese manufacturers are very, very, very good. And uh, the only problem here is they have limited resources and uh, don't get the products in the in the right price. Um, yeah. We see this in the water cooling. We see this in the water cooling. We have a manufacturer there in Taiwan as well. He's doing great products, but he's totally expensive compared to us. Yeah. You know. So, because a big price, a big thing for products is the price, and in the end, um, for hardware in general, electronics or actually physical hardware, anything you build, um, volume makes what price goes down, right? And um, not only that, not only that, it's not only the volume. Yep. This is also about the manufacturing process himself. If you're doing everything handmade, yeah, in China it's possible if you to do that in this way because you have a lot of uneducated, low-price worker 
who are doing that. Yeah, uh, we, for example, we don't supporting that as German company into doing this way. So we working on machines. We working on that's uh, high educated people working in our company and get uh, the right price. I mean, get the right salary. And uh, um, so we are, like you say, we need to have the volume to get the price down. And the yeah. price down come only by the raw materials. So we, our price just based on the good purchase of quantities of raw materials. Oh, and yeah. uh, especially and in, in our way is copper, for example. Yeah, especially I was about to say that, like, especially copper and aluminiums are two yeah. highly volatile uh, pricing for raw materials. I mean, we happen to have some experience as well uh, from the aluminium point of view with the open bench table project that we're uh, part of. But um, on, on your side, uh, over the past few years, we have seen that the, the price of copper have been increasing, the price of aluminium have been increasing. Uh, sometimes the price of tooling is changing as well, even though like you even produce more. Um, what, what was the, from like a overall point of view not not specifically about one product but on the overall point of view on your on your side how do you think that is impacting anyone that wants to get uh, to get in is that like a, a barrier of entry for any newcomers on the market uh, the quantity in, in, in China is getting higher and higher uh, for them for the first order because of one issue is the Chinese never give up their margin module. I mean, if you're going to Germany and or to Europe in or even in US and you're asking a manufacturer to produce, for example, CNC parts, they do it already after uh, for 20 piece. Yeah, you pay then more, but you get 20 piece done. In China is the thinking way different. They want to have certain kind of margin for their doing and that's why they want high volume because they're thinking they need to earn this kind of money. Yeah. They didn't understand the way how we work. We work in, in, in Western world, we're working on what cost if directly a product and we calculating what a product costs. That means how much cost the raw material, how much cost the working time and how many workers are necessary for it. If you ask in Chinese manu uh, manufacturers, they even don't know how many workers working on one project? As long as the and, margin is safe, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, they just have a basic calculation. They say, oh, we need to have 150%. They say, what? 150%? Yeah, but this is their yeah. way how they're, they're calculating. You know, Which makes it especially hard uh, if you want to put, for example, the whole Kickstarter culture into, into the mix there is that for Kickstarters that don't score enough money to produce enough products, that's where they end up hitting the wall when they get to China, because then they arrive, they have the money, they have a project, and then the guy still says no, because what, you only want 10,000 pieces? I'm not going to be that. Go to yep. someone else, yep. you know? <laughs> yep. And, and, and when you see in China, you, you mentioned Shenzhen, for example. Shenzhen has changed a lot in the, the last uh, 20 years. When I was there uh, in the beginning, beginning of 2005, 2006, and up to 2010, there was millions of workers there. And everyone doing manufacturing, everyone starting a new company. If you're going now there, you see very, very less people there. But what you see is higher quality of people, better educated people. That's why uh, China say for Shenzhen, it's the high-end hub now. Yeah, high -end it's hub more means, startup and electric, yeah, like you get, software stuff maybe, and less yes, manufacturing. Yes. And, and electronic it, engineering and so yeah, on. Yeah, especially a lot of electronic. I mean, for, for the people that don't know uh, what we're talking about, like basically Xiaomi, which is the, the cell phone brand that is going, uh, was well, going... in Asia, it's big and super cheap, yeah. Yeah, and, and they were doing like high-end cell phones compared... They were basically going head-to-head -head with Samsung top-of-the-line cell phones for like half the price. They were made out, uh, out of Shenzhen. Uh, OnePlus also in Shenzhen. Uh, OnePlus right? was in Shenzhen as well. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so, um, yeah, for sure. I mean, like those guys now in Shenzhen basically compete with what the Taiwanese have been known for for many years. Yeah. Uh, for China, is this the, the, the biggest problem and also a tough mission for the government to, to achieve that, what Taiwan did? I mean, Taiwan have still for everyone good health care, still for mm -hmm. everyone a good salary. 
I mean, if you're asking Taiwanese, I will say it's not good enough. But it's it's in the in the way how they do it, very very good. And uh, China have their. Yeah, um, uh, I mean, I think a bigger problem to do that. Yeah. You know. All right. Um, moving on now, uh, more focused on AlphaCo and uh, modding okay. uh, specifically. Uh, okay. Can you tell us more about, for example, how uh, AlphaCo works with uh, case modders and the world of uh, PC modding? Uh, what's your strategy around it? How, how do you guys sort of feel uh, and see that? How do you fit in there? Mm -hmm. um, for AlphaCo and um, also for Aqua Tuning, but more for AlphaCo is the long tradition to working with modders directly. Um, we we doing sponsoring already as as long as I'm in the company and I'm I'm joined the company 2013. Um, is is that the way how we're doing marketing? We show the products and the best thing is we working with people who are really have passion for creating systems. Whatever they do, if they're doing case mods for a chassis. And still need products, products inside, who look thing awesome, and there we come. Um, but it's also people who just are great in hard tube bendings or doing crazy stuff with with the system himself, overclockers, for example. All these people, we we supporting them directly. We are talking with them, and everyone is welcome to come to us to visit us in Braunschweig or just. Just call us or give us an, an email. Facebook mm -hmm. people know us. We are very strong in Facebook, and uh, uh, they can us reach out very easily there. So you say sponsoring. You're not at the one million mark yet. I was about to say that one. <laughs> Do you sponsor someone for one million dollar? <laughs> no, no, no. We don't sponsor <laughs> one for one million dollar, but we're sponsoring one million in many in many people. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay, okay. no, 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 no. It's not one million, but it's just still, still a lot. Yeah. And what we're giving out, of course, we don't give it to the small teenager. We also watching, watching what kind of, uh, oh, yeah, followers they have, how many people watching him. Yeah, as so if you have a website where a lot of people are watching you, or you know how to come in social media forward, then you should be in contact with us. Yeah. So basically, for someone that is uh, either in PC modding already today, has been doing it for a while, uh, maybe has a fellowship of some sort, uh, what is sort of the the process, or what does they need to to prepare to come and see you? Do they need to prepare like maybe some 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 small slide and some pitch, or just an email with the link to the networks is sufficient? Um, is there a specific process or something that you expect? I mean, the people who just need to write an email, I think we already have them. Um, because they just drop an email, we directly know who they are and directly say, oh, of course, of course, we do something. But if we don't know you, we really need to understand how your business works and uh, how many people are working with you. I mean, how, how, how strong you are in the community. Hmm. Interesting. The, on, on the way for the process and things, if there's things that, if, like for example, someone that is starting that have done like maybe like one or two mods, want to get that to the next level, um, do you have any guidelines in terms of uh, viewership, in terms of minimum of builds uh, that people have to do before actually start sponsoring them, or that's something that changed from uh, case to case? To be honest with you, we don't have that. We 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 really checking case by case. Uh, we give also very often people just a try. We see they have just 700 people who are following. Okay, come on, he get an ice bear, and uh, let's see what what's come out. Maybe he can do a special raffle or whatever, a special action giveaway, something like that, and see what is the response. Um, we have also um, uh, partners before who have a really wide range of uh, followers, I mean, on their page, so you see millions of people and you're thinking, oh, that's that's the amazing guy. Then you give him something and no one responds at all. <laughs> um, you know, it's also possible. So you never know, you know. For example, Overclockers, Overclockers TV, if you're just watching this, this site by views, I mean, compared to 
other meteors, you're looking small. But what is the difference between you and all others is all the people who are now watching us are really into it. They're 100% they're behind it. In the other medias, you have a lot of people who just don't understand what we're talking now. You know, and <laughs> yeah. that's a good thing. Actually, so that makes me sort of take the parallel uh, in terms of like, so we mentioned the whole money world before with uh, big esports. Uh, there are a lot of brands um, that are sort of either your competitors or that are within the PC industry that have been spending a lot of money in the previous, say, five years to sort of jump on that uh, esports bandwagon and sort of like make sure to take a seat at the table before it takes off and then it's in the hands of uh, big money like uh, Coca-Cola. Big... Or yeah, like, like that. Basically the too far point. away from their reach and to be there before and before they get forgotten, basically, uh, in terms of branding, at least. Um, yeah. What is sort of your, your position, guys, for, for that? Because modding, obviously, is not as big as esports. Do you guys uh, also sponsor esports things? Do you work with esports team? Or do you keep it mostly to people that are really hardware-focused enthusiasts? I don't, I don't uh, see a big benefit for sponsoring esports directly. Because um, the situation here is the typical gamer even don't know how to build a system. I mean, an eSport gamer. Mm -hmm. They are very, very, very hard working on that, that they have high skills in using the software, I mean the game, yeah, but not to taking care of the hardware. That's a little bit of kind of marketing lie what the keyboard brands and so on want to tell you that they're so much take care about what kind of keyboard or what kind of mouse they use. And especially for the water cooling, he don't care how the CPU get cooled, just the CPU is cooled and the graphic card as well. So here I don't see the biggest benefit. Here's better we're working with partners who are doing that already. I mean, mm -hmm. they have, like we're doing it with Medion, for example, we sponsoring with Medion together, eSport teams and we help them to doing that. Um, that's that's for us fine, but for our brand name, I mean, AlphaCore is not necessary to doing that. Speaking of brand names, uh, AlphaCore is very well known for having very German names for the product. Iceberg. <laughs> Iceberg. Iceberg. And, yes. and, and so on. So th this yes. has been a running joke for, for the past few years, especially since you guys have been more and more visible on the international space. Uh, YouTuber you... can pronounce properly the names of your product, especially the American YouTubers. <laughs> Is yeah. there something going up with that? Is there some change that we can expect or we have to hit it and just try to learn German again? Um, no, not everyone needs to learn German. <laughs> um, even our government want to have it. Uh, we still uh, try to find words who can speak English native speaker as well. Okay. That's difficult. It's difficult to do. Uh, we don't want to hiding that we are coming from Germany and that we have uh, German thinking behind it. Um, we try to find the bridge. It's sometimes successful, sometimes not. For example, our fitting, I guess still people cannot say I something. Can you say it? <laughs> I something. I something. Yeah, perfect. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I, I, okay, okay. Full disclosure: I learned German for seven years. Oh, you cheated! <laughs> <laughs> and you lived in Germany for some time. Ah, ah, so that's it's fine. That, that it's won't work. Not a big deal, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we have we have uh, um, before some products who, or even in the launch of the products uh, where the word uh, for us is, as German very simple to say, but for British or for American, totally impossible to say. Um, so we we need to change sometimes, even in the launch process, the naming, and we try to minimize this kind of accidents. Uh, <laughs> lucky is we have now native speakers in our company who help us to to avoid this kind of things. I was actually about to, to talk about uh, uh, about uh, about Dave. So Dave is a, a British guy, right? He's part of the yep. company now. It's actually he's one of the case motor as well that moved into uh, into alpha call so that was uh, quite interesting to to see that and we, we saw that from an outsider point of view and we're like oh damn like dave is now part of that and things um how do you see to have you sponsored a lot of case mother yep. and and you have local case mother that works within the company how do yep. you see that fitting uh 
Uh, do you think there could be like some kind of like a rivalry between each of them? Like, oh yeah, you get all the stuff because you work in the company. Um, because we have experienced that in the overclocking world when top overclockers actually move to a specific company. Uh, do you think and see that happening in the uh, PC modding world today? Um, actually, before um, uh, we had we have had met, met this kind of issue. We we announced last year the the AlphaCool team, and uh, then we just spent money on Alpha te AlphaCool team member for for sponsoring. I mean, we sent them parts, and all others don't get parts. Mm -hmm. And then we get a lot of, let's Backlash. say, uh, not nice emails back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so we change the strategy now. So it means now, for to be a member of the Alpha Cool team, you need to have um, a good reputation. So people need to be aware of you. And if you, if we find out. You are a good guy, and people be aware of you. And you like to be our partner, then of course you can be a member of Alphaco team. But everyone who just not so far famous or not so far good at modding, but still passion for it, can sponsor it as well. We we just checking what they're doing. To enter that team, do you need to be exclusive after that to Alphaco gear in terms of cooling stuff, or it's not an exclusive sort of relationship? Uh, it's not this kind of. This was before not, and will be in the future not be exclusive. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't want to be in this way that we limit the the industry. Right. We see we see people creating great stuff, even also from our competitors, and we love to see that. We are not worried about any kind of competition, and we don't need to do this in this way that we limited it. I mean, say you only can work in with Alpha Cool. No, that's not the way how we do it. Uh, I I have to say I I like the way that it's not exclusively locked in, so it uh, it keeps the creativity and the uh, the different tries out, and you can find out like you find something very interesting in one way of building a product that you can reintegrate that in other uh, kind of products. It's uh, pretty interesting. Uh, speaking of the competitions, mm -hmm. all the competition is going RGB, RGB here, RGB there. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. You guys are doing some RGB stuff as well with like the the SLI uh, RGB. We're getting pushed into it. We're getting pushed into it. <laughs> Do you mean you I have mean, no choice? <laughs> if you want to have a kind of success, especially in the American market, you 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 need to have RGB. Okay. So we working we working heavily on that. That we have um, RGB and RG, address, addressable RGB as well, and um, controllers for it. We're working on a special controller already a long time. You guys being aware of it, you be talking also privacy about that. Um, mm -hmm. We we have a lot of stuff coming up in our new electronic department, and I hope this will be released soon because I want to sell it. I want to sell it, and uh, because is this is this. I mean, guys, is this RGB? RGB. Everyone wants that currently. It's like this. Yeah. Set but true, yeah. We have no, but, uh, so RGB is good. Editor. RGB yeah. is good, but you have to do it right. So I would mm -hmm. be looking forward to how you. you guys do the software for that because most companies they have RGB, they have the the specs, they have the hardware, they have the the components to do it right, and then usually the software is a problem. The software either sucks or the software. Mm -hmm. Uh, takes for In interoperability as well is the big issue. Uh, people have a lot of problems, you know, when you mix up different kinds of gear. Like if you mix up Kuda Master, Corsair, Aces, G Skill, everything all together in your case, and then people start to get problems because they use some of the same uh, communication protocols, and then you have all that kind of stuff. So I, I'd be interested to see how um, Afaku and uh, German engineering engineering is addressing that. You yeah, mean how we, they are addressing the addressable RGB. <laughs> Oh, we try to address uh, with our own software mm -hmm. before, and this uh, was seemingly successful in our pre-testing um, pre and the focus group meetings with uh, dedicated models and uh, dedicated uh, people we choose for checking it. And so we decide, okay, we need to work with bigger brands who already have knowledge in that. So we mm -hmm. have now a corporation running. I cannot mention the name because it's not final yet, but it's a big company in the gaming industry and famous for their software as well. 
<laughs> so we can expect that your stuff will integrate with one of this big gaming industry within mm -hmm, the RGB mm -hmm, space. Mm -hmm. Interesting take. Well, that's uh, I, I can't I can't disagree with that uh, personally. Uh, I think the uh, the software side and the control and the ecosystem is the biggest issue on the RGB side because technically Correctly. we have addressable RGB now. Not a big deal. Just now to make it look good and not have this rainbow all the time. And I want to choose the color depending on the game I play or the things I do on my PC. Same with the keyboard, actually. Uh, I have an RGB keyboard and it's not doing the flashy things all the time. And people say, oh, that's that's weird. It's not moving. It's like, no, that's how it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be that's colors not... <laughs> flashing in every direction. It has Correct a me. purpose. It has to save, say, serve a purpose. Yeah. And then that's the uh, the add value for for. And I personally thinking on the the future of, of uh, this kind of lighting effects will be not handled by the software, uh, not handled by the hardware anymore. This will be handled by the software. So yeah, in, the, in the future, Google Home, your Alexa, your smartphone, all the whatever, devices. yeah. So the software will creating the details of the lighting in the in the future. So like, if you have disco effects or special rings or running around or something like that all these will come out from the software and yeah. the software will make the difference and um, there will be a lot of competition for sure in the software industry only for that for sure that's going to be interesting for sure indeed uh almost one hour we're in the show like 15 minutes so we have 10 minutes more on a few more questions uh do you have more questions for yes i think i asked everything i had here so i'm good Perfect. I don't have any questions for you, but stay around, Jens, please. Thank you very much for your time here. Uh, but stick around because we have a few more topics to discuss for this uh, live show. Uh, first of all, OMG PAX panel at PAX East is going on on uh, Friday 29th of March. So that's in about two weeks from now. And that's going to be in Boston. That's going to be 6 p.m. at the Condor Theater. Be there. Friday at PAX East is sold out already. So be there, 6 p.m., the Condor Theater. And I we heard, can... Uh, I heard there's some cool guests. And there's going to be some cool guests, and we can already announce one. Uh, so on the PAX East side, it says Tech Jesus is on the list. Actually, we uh, there's a, a slight issue on the planning, and um, Tech Jesus, so Gamers Nexus, cannot make it. But don't worry, we're going to have a lot of good, good guests for this one. We can announce the first one... Tonight, that's going to be Pedro from PCMR, so the founder of the PC Master Race uh, community, will be on the panel with us. Uh, that's going to be pretty interesting to have him, to have his take and his view on uh, on the whole community. And wait for next week because we're going to have more information about that. If you want to have more details about who's going to be there, how we're going to do things and so on, you can always follow us on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash overclocking TV, as well as uh, Facebook, where we're going to give uh, most Facebook of the updates. Event too, yeah. And there's a Facebook event. I think it's the OMG PAX panel, I think. Yeah, you can just find it if you go on the facebook.com slash overclocking TV page, and over there in the events, it's right there. You can visit. It has very nice red colors, the PAX East colors. Other good, important things about the PAX panel, uh, we will be building two computers live on stage. There's going to be one big computer and one small computer. There's going to be more details in the next coming days, so stick around. And we can already announce that HyperX, EVG, and Corsair will be giving away some of the hardware that we'll be using. So we're going to have the hardware from cool. these three brands, at least these three brands that we can announce. And there's more coming. And we can, uh, we're going to do a giveaway there as well. So you have to be there. I mean, if you'll go to Baxi's, live in Boston, or actually... No. Well, leaving the, the US. thing is, not all panels are streamed live, and this one is not streamed live at the uh, PAX, so you gotta be there to, to print something. Maybe we'll have a few spare parts to do a, a social media one. I, Let's I'll, see. Let's see. If I don't keep all the RAM for myself. That's not gonna happen. Uh, <laughs> if you're talking about PAX, we also be on PAX. I mean, okay. we are on, on the uh, Mod My Mods uh, stage, so. You can see there a lot of uh, water cooling in the newest water cooling products there as well. Any famous mothers that will be there that you think people should go and meet? That's in hand. That's in the hand of uh, um, Mod my Joe Mods. Mod my Mods, and I guess for sure there will be someone. <laughs> All right, so that's it for packs. That's it for packs. Yeah. But we can already announce that we're gonna have 
another meetup at TwitchCon Europe, uh, the OMG TwitchCon meetup. Uh, we talked about it uh, last week already. So TwitchCon Europe is happening in Berlin mid-April. So that's going to be, I think, like 13th to 15th of April. Uh, for like. Oh yeah, that's the weekend, like, like 13th and 14th, uh, 14th of April. Uh, that's going to be in Berlin. We will be there. We're going to do a meetup there. Stay tuned. We're going to announce where and when exactly. But if you plan to go there, let us know in the comments, either on the Twitch uh, replay video or on the YouTube replay that we're going to have uh, uploaded in the next uh, few minutes. And same again, there's a Facebook event page for that. So you definitely should join. And even if you don't attend TwitchCon, because there won't be a meetup inside the TwitchCon hall will probably be outside. That's going to be outside uh, for sure. At a local bar or something cool. Maybe even you, James, oh. you could join. Um, then basically, uh, you can also join. So it doesn't need to be specifically someone that has a TwitchCon ticket. Especially because that's going to be a, a smaller TwitchCon than one, the one we, are, yeah. uh, we have seen. Yeah, I think sold out anyway, right? I haven't checked. Anyway, yeah. we have the ticket, so I didn't check for that. All right, uh, that's a wrap-up for this week. Yep. Where can we find the show? So the show can be found uh, on YouTube, youtube.com slash overclocking TV. You will have the replay day w there within the next hour. So and we upload it every time. So if you missed the other shows, you can also check them out. Last week we did a show on cryptocurrency and all that. So it was really interesting. You should check it out. Um, you can find also that episode as an audio version, as a podcast version, everywhere you listen to podcasts. So that could be um, Spotify, Google Google Podcasts, I think it's They call it Google right? Podcasts now. Uh, yeah. iTunes, if you're, you have an iOS device. And Stitcher. All the, and Stitcher. So all the other good places to listen to podcasts too. So you should definitely go there and subscribe to it uh, because not everyone has the time or the bandwidth uh, to look at a, a nice stream like this one. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much, Tim, for, for your time this week. Thank okay. you very much, Jens, for being part of us Thank this you. week Thank as you for well. having me. Uh, it Thank was you. awesome to have you here. Check out the replay and see you next week. See you next week.